Good morning, Cedar Lane. It's great to see you all on this beautiful, beautiful day. Welcome. I'm Abhi Janamanchi, one of the ministers serving this religious community. My pronouns are he and him. Picture me as an Indian male in his 50s with dark hair, a graying mustache and beard, wearing a green vest, a black shirt and pants. Happy St. Patrick's Day. As we gather for worship today, let us warmly greet one another, especially our guests this morning, with open hearts as we embark on this sacred journey and adventure together. Thank you. 
It's a beautiful day at Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We gather this morning on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank and Piscataway Konoi peoples, as well as the land where enslaved African people and their descendants toiled without choice or recompense. We honor their enduring presence, wisdom, and stewardship of this land throughout generations past, present, and future. Welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation. In this inclusive and diverse community, we wholeheartedly embrace you for who you are, whom you love, wherever you find yourself on life's journey and whatever your beliefs, sexual orientation, gender identity, documentation status, or disability. To our newcomers and guests, whether present in person or joining us online, we extend a warm Cedar Lane welcome. We're supposed to do all this on cue now. If you're new among us, uh, and feel comfortable doing so, please introduce yourself in the chat online or raise your hand so we may greet you and express our gratitude with a small token of appreciation. I see many guests, newcomers this morning. Thank you. Thank you for taking the risk to worship with us this morning because sometimes it is a risk. <laughs> I also extend a warm Cedar Lane welcome to our distinguished guest this morning, Kamyar Arsani, a gifted musician known for his soul-stirring melodies, and Imam Tarif Shreem, who is a Muslim chaplain at the University of Maryland, College Park, whose profound wisdom and guidance enriches our journey. Their presence here today promises to inspire and uplift us all. Welcome. <laughs> After our service, we invite you to stay for fellowship, coffee, and treats in our brand new lounge with uh, wonderful furniture that uh, already is being tested by everybody. Uh, so we hope you will, you will stick around to test them out further. And if you're curious to learn more about Unitarian Universalism or become involved in our congregation, please fill out the newcomer form that's linked in the chat or connect with one of our greeters. And if you feel called to deepen your involvement and contribute to our mission and ministry, we invite you to consider taking the next step on your spiritual journey by becoming a member at Cedar Lane. Your presence enriches our community and we welcome you with open hearts and hands. So please join me after the service here to embark on this transformative journey. And to stay updated on Cedar Lane news and events, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter on our website's homepage at cedarlane.org. Our caring ministry team serves as an extension of the ministry here at Cedar Lane. Lori Richardson, a dedicated member of the team, is available to offer you support in person. Shukran, Lori. <laughs> Lori spent some time in Turkey. Today, as we gather, we unite in solidarity with our Muslim siblings around the world and in our community to commemorate the sacred month of Ramadan. Ramadan is a time of fasting, prayer, reflection, and recommitment. It is a time when we draw closer to the holy, the nameless one of many names and beyond all naming, a time to strengthen our bonds with one another, a time to recommit ourselves to the ongoing work of justice, equity, and liberation for all people. In this spirit, 
we gather. In this spirit, we worship. Our opening words this morning is from the Sufi mystic poet, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi. And this is uh, something you may be familiar with, the poem, The Guest House. Kamran and I are going to offer excerpts of this poem. I will share the English version, and Kamran will sing the Farsi version. This place is an animal and entirely a guest. Every day, it seems someone else arrives and departs. Blessed are these guests, each one who arrives, for a treasure has been revealed in this valley. This place is like a tavern from the night before, for it has stolen houses and shops from you and from me. In the bright day of our lives, our souls have come, not just one soul from the dark night when life came. A soul whose departure from love bound hands and feet, and from that sorrow which breath by breath brings into our hearts with pain. I moan and sigh, and for God's sake you ask what state this is? Here, the joy of the heart is the companionship of solitude, for anyone without companionship cannot reach the heart of friends. Although our lives are lost to sorrow, blessed are the fortunate ones who laugh at themselves. Here, suddenly someone's life was from life, past or from a wretched body returned. Blessed are those who have tasted spring, for they have become God's gardens. Whatever you know, say that this is, and whatever you know, Know with the mind, know with the bread. Say whatever you know, and whatever you know, say that. He knows that all the world knows from him. This place is complete, and never beneath nor above, because enough. سفر کردم بر شهری دبیدم چو شهر عشق من شهری ندیدم ندانستم ز اول قدره آن شهر نادانی از این قربت کشیدم سفر کردم به هر شهری دبیدم چو شهر عشق من شهری ندیدم ندانستم چه اول قدر آن شرط نادانی از این قربت کشیدم بر عشق آواز دهل بود در آوازی که در عالم شنیدم به غیر عشق آواز دهل بود هر آوازی که در عالم شنیدم سفر کردم به هر شهری دمیدم چو شهر عشق من شهری ندیدم ندانستم ز اول قدر آن شهر ز نادانی بسی غرمت کشیدم
Shukran. Hello, I am David Devlin Foltz, the worship associate for today's service. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a short, white, cisgender, heterosexual male in my late 60s, wearing a green shirt and a green vest to honor Islam and St. Patrick's Day. I have glasses, brown hair, and a graying beard. In our Unitarian Universalist tradition, we light a chalice each time we gather as a symbol of our faith and our gathered community. Our community includes three Afghan families with whom Cedar Lane volunteers walk as they address the challenges of creating new lives for themselves here. Let us welcome Charlene Zelmer, representing the Afghan Refugee Support Ministry, to light the chalice today. Please rise in body and or in spirit to share the chalice lighting words. <laughs> there came a lock, but the key is with us. Ramadan shut our mouths and opened our eyes, and now the light that the eyes beheld is with us forever. We have purified our heart and soul by fasting, even though the body is still with us. Even though there is suffering in fasting, the unseen treasure of the heart is with us. Ramadan came to serve the heart. As for the one who created the heart, the one is with us. And now please remain as you are to sing, Come, come, whoever you are. thousand times you've broken your vows a thousand times come come whoever you are wander worshiper lover of leaving us is no care of and of despair come yet again Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Jill Russ. I am a 65-year-old white woman with short brown hair and glasses. Today I am wearing complimentary colors to St. Patrick's, evidently, with a kind of a peachy blouse. <laughs> so. My spiritual journey as part of the Cedar Lane community began several years ago online during the pandemic. However, I have probably been a Unitarian Universalist since I was a young child. 
Even though I was not aware that there was this shared practice that combines the teachings of the world's religions, science, nature, and philosophy, I was born and raised in the Ferguson suburb of St. Louis, the only child of conservative, prejudiced, Protestant Christians. We went to church every Sunday and practiced tithing. I had my little envelopes that I would put 10% of my allowance in each week. I remember it was a coin, maybe a nickel. The envelope would go on the collection plate and be added to all the other money, a tangible symbol of everyone combining their resources to enable important works to be funded. To me, this made perfect sense. One should support the values one thinks of as important in whatever small ways one can. Then one Sunday, the minister was giving a sermon in which he quoted that whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Wait a second, I thought. What about kids who live somewhere really far away, like Africa, who were good kids, but through no fault of their own, had never heard of Jesus. Were they condemned? My parents' response was that this is why missionaries are so very important. (laughs) So they can tell these kids about Jesus so that they won't go to hell. Perhaps I should give my tithes specifically to missionaries. This answer didn't cut it with me, even though I was still not tall enough to see over the pew when seated. It was so obviously not right, not fair. My whole concept of the secure religious community began to crumble. With time, I began to push back, eventually rejecting the entire Bible since, as I had been told, this was an all or nothing scenario. No cherry picking allowed. Fast forward through the next 50 plus years, (laughs) where I eventually decided that I could indeed cherry pick from various religious and spiritual philosophies and texts, and over time developed a slightly more thought out individual set of core values that I applied to my life. Nothing written out, but something more amorphous. Here's the bit where Cedar Lane comes in. (laughs) Whenever I drove past Cedar Lane, I always thought it appeared to be very beautiful and serene. But the sign, Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church, I knew what that was code for. (laughs) Some flavor of Protestant. I have been shuffled around as a child to many different churches of differing denominations. Lutheran, Episcopalian, and Reform, Congregational, etc. There was no sign out front that said, Jill, we are not who you think we are. <laughs> so, then one day at the beginning of the pandemic, when being bored, I Googled Cedar Lane UU. <laughs> Within minutes, I was totally transfixed. It was almost like someone had reached way into the recesses of my brain and had carefully articulated so many of the values I had struggled so hard to obtain. And there was more to learn. Clearly, these UUers had done a lot of delving into many, many topics. I decided to watch a Cedar Lane service on YouTube. When I first heard the now familiar phrase that includes, we gather on the ancient lands of the Piscataway, We honor with gratitude the land and people who have protected it through the generations without hope for reward. I was so moved that I literally burst into tears. (laughs) That was the beginning of many eureka moments I have experienced so far in my first two years with all of you. From attending virtual educational You use sessions, joining a soul circles group, becoming a member, attending Sunday services regularly via Zoom, and now more in person, plus doing a bit of volunteering. 
I am now feeling very much at home in this community of Cedar Laners. If I could perhaps finish my affirmation with reiterating, especially during this time of spiritual renewal, of my long-held belief of giving to support the values one believes are important in whatever ways one can, either monetarily and are giving of one's times and talents. That includes during this important upcoming time of funding our annual budget to join with each other in giving to ourselves the means to continue to build a new way as members of our beloved Cedar Lane community. Thank you. Reverend Abi said, yeah, go follow that. <laughs> All right, allow me to take us to a different place. Let us now take a moment to ground ourselves and fully immerse in the present moment invoking all the wellsprings of love that reside within, among, and beyond us. In this cherished community, I'm tearing up. <laughs> where, <coughs> where we discover connection and purpose, this compassionate gathering where we can freely share our joys and sorrows, finding solace, affection, and restoration we unite to create a sacred sanctuary for each other, to bear and embrace the joys and sorrows of all present, and to keep close in our hearts those absent from our midst this morning. Within our Cedar Lane community, we hold in our hearts those grieving a loss, those navigating or supporting a loved one through illness or chronic pain, those facing visible or hidden illnesses, those embracing parenting as a spiritual journey. Our caring extends beyond Cedar Lane, embracing those affected by loss, conflict, and calamities across our world. In our hearts, we hold the memory of all those lost to the ongoing violence in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We mourn the tragic loss of Ryan Gaynor, a neurodivergent 15-year-old black teenager who was shot and killed by police in his home in San Bernardino, California, during a dispute with his mother. We also carry those who had been wounded, both physically and spiritually, as well as those consumed by indescribable anguish over the loss of their loved ones. May our friends, companions in the world, and all the joys and sorrows in our hearts find solace within the embrace of silence and prayer. As we journey into this moment of silence together, those who are mourning a loss are invited to rise, whether physically or in spirit, and offer the names of their loved ones into the silence. May we hold the silence as the silence holds us.
holding all the joys and sorrows that we carry in our hearts, within our community and beyond. I invite us to center our mind, body, and spirit into this space made sacred by the presence of the holy and the presence of each and every one of us. Find a comfortable seated position, placing your feet on the floor. Let your back be straight, but not too rigid. Your hands resting gently on your lap. Close your eyes softly or lower your gaze. And settle into that space, that space within a place of silence and honesty, love and compassion. Let us begin by taking a few deep breaths together, inhaling slowly through our nose and exhaling gently through the mouth. And allow each breath to bring a sense of relaxation to your body and your mind. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Now bring your attention to your breath Notice the natural rhythm of your breathing, the sensation of the air flowing in and out. And as you continue to focus on your breath, let go of any thoughts or distractions that may naturally arise. Gently unhook yourself. and simply observe them without judgment. And then gently bring your attention back to your breath. And now imagine yourself surrounded by a warm, soothing light. This light represents the divine presence the source of all love and compassion. Feel this light enveloping you, encompassing you, filling you with a sense of peace and serenity. Allow the light to radiate within and without. And as you bask in this light, allow yourself to become aware of any sensations or emotions that you're holding or arising within you. Notice any feelings of joy, gratitude, or contentment as well as any sorrow, anxiety, or discomfort. Simply observe them with openness and compassion. Now bring to mind someone or something that you are grateful for. 
It could be a loved one, a friend, a cherished memory, a community, or simply the beauty of nature. Take a moment to express gratitude for this blessing in your life, allowing yourself to fully savor the feelings of appreciation and love. Continue to deep breathe mindfully, allowing yourself to remain present in this moment of tafakur or deep reflection. Take the time for a few more moments to simply be allowing yourself to connect with the divine presence within and around you. When you feel ready, Gently bring your awareness back to your surroundings and join me in chanting Om Shanti 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 He. Shanti in Sanskrit means peace. And when chanted three times, we invoke inner peace, communal peace, universal peace. Om Shanti 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 our day into our lives. May it be so.
بر هیچ دلی مباد و بر هیچ تنی بر هیچ دلی مباد و بر هیچ تنی آن چس قمه شان تو بر جان من است آن چس قمه شان تو بر جان من است دل تنگم و دیدان به تو درمان من است بیرنگ رو خط زبان زندان من است بر هیچ دلی آی مباد و هیچ تنی بر هیچ دلی آی مباد و بر تنی شان تو بر جان من است آن چست همه هشران تو بر جان من است به تنگم و دیدار تو در آن من است او از تو جدا شده است آقوش مرا از گریه کسی آی ندید خاموش مرا از جان و دل آی دید فراموش نهی از بر خدا از بر خدا از بر خدا مکن فراموش مرا از بر خدا مکن فراموش مرا او از تو جدا شده از آموش مرا او از تو جدا شده از آموش مرا از گریه کسی ندید خاموش مرا از جان و دل های دیده آی جان و دل های دیده آی فراموش نهی از بحر خدا از بحر خدا مکن فراموش مرا از بحر خدا مکن فراموش مرا Each Sunday, as we give and receive an offering to sustain the mission and ministry of our religious community and the work of a community organization or a ministry, we reinforce our commitment to the values of our Unitarian Universalist faith and the bonds of our cherished community. Through our collective generosity, we affirm our pledge to support our mission and ministries compensate our devoted staff and preserve the comfort and beauty of our sacred spaces. When we pass the plate during our worship, 
We publicly acknowledge that the act of giving interwoven into our spiritual practice is essential to our journey towards spiritual growth, fostering communal connection and building a more just world. Ramadan is a time of solidarity and compassion, a time to extend support to those in need. And today, in the spirit of zakat, the Islamic pillar of charitable giving, we are privileged to direct our entire plate offering to support the invaluable work of the Afghan Families Refugee Support Team. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mary Catherine O'Donnell, a dedicated member of the team, as she shares more about their vital efforts. Thank you, Abi, and good morning, everyone. This is my first time on the new stage, and um, looks great. <laughs> so, uh, as Abi mentioned, uh, today's full plate uh, collection will be um, given to support three Afghan refugee families who are resettling in Montgomery account County. Uh, we're very honored this morning to have Mr. Al Kozai with us, and we appreciate uh, his attending today's service. Thank you. While working with the families, we have seen just how difficult it is to adapt and navigate in a new country and the process of resettling here. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to get, to get comfortable with the processes and um, ways of our country. The congregation to date has generously help support the families in many ways, from helping to settle, uh, set up apartments and find housing, to making uh, and driving people to various appointments, health care, or with other government agencies. We've provided some babysitting, some tutoring. We provide many other types of non-financial support as well. Uh, many hours are spent advocating with the resettlement agencies and offices, and also with dealing with U.S. governmental agencies, many of which are inefficient and have uh, proven difficult to deal with. We made financial assistance throughout the year as needed, um, and I'd like to recognize uh, two of our members who donated their car to the, uh, one of the families, and we spent many hours uh, helping the new owner practice, and he achieved uh, his U.S. driver's permit. Earning enough money to support their families is a most urgent need and will enable all of these families to become independent. We have um, several of the families, uh, the parents are working. However, they need better paying jobs to meet their expenses and to find, some still need to find work. The additional funding that we hope to use will allow parents to train for new job opportunities, to further their expertise in a particular uh, field, to have their college degrees uh, from abroad translated and verified, and to become proficient in English. These are just a few of the examples um, that uh, have been occurring and will continue to occur uh, there are other needs that will arise, and they will be addressed as we uh, become aware of them. But I would like to ask once again for your generosity to assist these well-deserving newcomers to our area. Thank you. As the ushers come forward, there are many different ways to give at Cedar Lane that you're already very familiar with, so I'm not going to go down the list. Whatever you give and however you choose to give, we are grateful for your support. And I hope this rhythm will help me give more and more. <laughs>
کار بانا باش دارن بی سر به سر تار مست بیر مست و خاج مست و یار مر یار مست کافر و مؤمن خراب و کافر و مؤمن خراب و زاهد و خمار مست زار با نان مشت و راندین سر به سر اکتار مست بیر مست و خاج مست و یار مست و یار مست خافر و مومن خراب و خافر و مومن خراب و زاهد و خمار مست سار بانان پشت و راندی سر به سر کار مست حال صورت این چونین و حال منی خود مفت رو مست و یار مستم یار مست شمس تبریزی به داره هیچ کس خوشیار نیست شمس تبریزی به دارت هیچ کس خوشیار نیست کافر و مومن خراب و کافر و مؤمن خراب و زاهد و خمار مست سار بانا نوشت و راندی سر به سر اکتار مست میر مست و خاجم مست و یار مست و یار مست Thank you. Greetings of peace. Uh, what a joy to be with all of you this morning. Um, truly blessed to be invited to this beautiful, beautiful sanctuary of, what can I say, beautiful souls souls of peace, compassion, souls of humanity, and I'm just blessed. Uh, thank you, my dear brother, my sibling in faith, dear Reverend Abi, for inviting me into your home and opening your heart to me and making me feel at home and blessing me with this beautiful gathering. I want to really say, because life is so short and we have to share, that you've really always filled me filled my heart and soul with inspiration and hope. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart. And I thank you and your beautiful community. Um, you were talking earlier about, in your walking us through that meditation about gifts to reflect on. And I swear by God that I couldn't think of a greater gift than your, you as a gift in my life and this beautiful community right in this moment. So thanks again. And I would like to begin my sermon with a verse in the Quran in which God Almighty tells us Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon In the Holy Quran, God Almighty talking to us about the blessed month of Ramadan, this 30-day period that comes every year. He commands us as believers to observe the fast when the month comes. This ninth lunar 
month in the lunar calendar, and reminding us that when we observe this fast by abstaining from food and drink from dawn until sunset, that we have, we are, we're carrying the legacy and the tradition of earlier nations and faiths and religions that have observed this important fast. That this is the way to observe this beautiful regimen of letting go of saying no to the wants of the body and the poisons of consumption, of power and greed and ego. Then he sums up why it's an awakening at the end. He says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ For one singular purpose, to become God conscious. Conscious. To move away from unconsciousness. Because when we're consumed by all the wants of the ego and the nagging self, in the moment to get what we want, when we want, and how we want. We trample on ourselves. We trample on others and trample on Mother Earth. And ultimately become unconscious of ourselves as humans. What a beautiful thing to move away into a state of consciousness right now. And all that I've witnessed this morning is consciousness. Consciousness of God, of ourselves as humans. Consciousness of each other. And indeed, when we rid the heart and the soul of the poisons, it's unveiled. And it can witness and see and connect and empathize and humanize and see the humanity of everyone, but we're ultimately we become witnesses to all that we witness, that we're meant to witness because the eye is meant to witness right now. The ear is meant to hear. These are amazing faculties and gifts. And the heart is supposed to feel. And the limbs of the body are supposed to act in the beautiful spirit and light of God, but after witnessing. And oftentimes we forget to witness or turn a blind eye to what we're witnessing, again, as an answer to the ego to seek comfort and to avoid what faith demands. And the hardest thing is to walk the walk of faith. I heard earlier the challenge of words and, right, and faith, and how do you reconcile the two, and so forth. Words are powerful, but they are they emanating from a heart that is truthful and authentic. And are we able to walk that walk of faith, and speaking, and bearing witness to truth and justice? It turns out that faith demands that. And ultimately, nothing embodies faith, and authenticity, and integrity, and humanity. Nothing embodies it more than when a moment that moment of trial and challenge shows up and when we're, when we're witnessing suffering and pain, that we're able to speak it, articulate it using the tongue and not to walk away from it and be silent, rendering the tongues that God equipped us with to speak lies and distort for nothing but ego and power and greed. And I'm blessed again by another gift that you've opened my home today to share a bit of what my heart carries this morning. What a beautiful thing to find that comfort and safety among siblings in humanity that really love, and I feel your love. And I cannot but think of the pain right now in that state of fast, because I cannot food or eat food, food and drink until sunset, that the witnessing is really intense, and the feeling of the pain of my own family, my own community, the population of Palestinians right now trapped in that little strip of land in Gaza. 2.3 million of them. 90% of them refugees. Refugees that have escaped. Escaped the, the horrors of ethnic cleansing, of genocide, decades ago. To find themselves in this area, this little strip of land, and they you know, had children, and their children had children more than three generations, and here they are, and we're witnessing this, they're under a genocide. As we speak right now, in this hour or two that we've spent, countless young souls, their lives have been robbed brutally. As we speak, as we stand here, mothers are crying, pleading for help right now. As we stand right here in this beautiful gathering, bombs, U.S.-made bombs, are being dropped on them. 40 at least in the hour. Every 30 seconds. Powerful, destructive bombs. Made here, many in Maryland, being dropped on our mothers, our fathers, and children who are screaming for help. 162 days of butchery, of carnage, of genocide that we're witnessing. 
Earth is witnessing. The clouds are witnessing. The trees are witnessing. Souls are witnessing and many pretend that it's not happening. It's tormenting to the heart. And the heart is meant to experience that pain, but it really leaves me as a human being, as a Palestinian, in a, in a, in a state of heartbrokenness, but indeed reflecting on what each of these souls mean. 162 days of witnessing with my eyes and my ears with my family of over 31,000 innocent Palestinians brutally killed, including over 13,000 children and infants. Oftentimes we cannot even fathom what that means. I want you to imagine 250 over, or close to 300 school buses right now. We observe them in Montgomery County in the morning, in the afternoon. Every single time I see a school bus with 50, 60 children, I think of the 13,000. Right now, 162 days later, close to 300 school buses obliterated all at once. And we're watching and we're witnessing. Carrying indeed the pain as we witness 70,000 Palestinians severely injured, over 25,000 Palestinian children being orphaned without a daddy or a mommy right now. And 10,000 with blown off limbs. No legs, no arms anymore because of the over 45,000 U.S. made bombs that have been dropped on them. Stories of amputations being carried out without any seizure. Of seeing images of parents carrying the remains of their children in body bags. Of losing their entire families. Entire families, I cannot even fathom what that means. 30, 40, 50 members of your family, entire ancestries have been wiped out over the 162 days, hearing the cries of children crying over their, the burned bodies of their parents because we're dropping on them also bombs that burn. The images of dogs and cats eating the flesh of dubbed corpses. I cannot escape that every single day that are not being buried. Stories and images of parents writing the names of their children on their body parts because they recognize any moment they're going to be killed. First, I cannot imagine living with that fear that every, any single second I'm going to die. My children are going to die. They bury their dead knowing that they're going to be next. Any second. And now they have to write the names of their children on their legs and arms so that when they're decimated, when the bombs fall on their homes, they can recognize them. I cannot fathom that. 162 days of witnessing an entire strip of land, five kilometers across, 40 kilometers north to south, being obliterated and decimated. All universities wiped out. All schools, can you imagine? All schools in Montgomery County, in the state of Maryland, all destroyed. All churches been hit. The most ancient, one of the most ancient churches in the world has been destroyed. All mosques, all homes of worship, nothing is left intact. 162 days of starving a whole population and indeed as we fast today. And I'm able and I'm privileged to be able to break my fast this evening with my community, my children, they have no food. Hearing that mother and seeing her image on the edge of a, of a bed with grief-sunken eyes clutching and holding tenderly the fingers of her infant who just died three hours earlier from starvation, from having no food and drink. I cannot run away from that. My eyes have seen that. And also the pain of counseling people here with families and friends there who have no idea what happened to their families. That I had to counsel over the 162 days many friends and relatives who have lost over, we know of, 500 people, including relatives and cousins of mine. They're gone. We cannot recover them anymore. That is real. Of my cousin who was also a medical doctor trying to help people he was shot at and killed. And the stories go on and on of that suffering. They're each a human being, just like you and me. We oftentimes mention them as statistics, but they're human beings with families who love them. They love their families. They had dreams. They cried. They laughed. They loved food. 
They were looking forward to Ramadan and to celebration afterward. Young souls who are so talented, professors, teachers, wiped, gone. And we're witnessing it. The whole world is witnessing it. A genocide like no other since World War, since world war II. A destruction like no other since World War II. We have to witness that, and it's real. And I carry that with my family, with our community, but also we carry the pain of knowing that this didn't start on October 7th because they want us to believe that. They still continue to dehumanize us as Palestinians and make us look like we're just violent people. We don't know how to live with peace. But no, no, no. We've endured this occupation and oppression for more than three generations, for more than 75 years now. Indeed, an occupation and oppression that only if people understand by living on a daily basis, they would fathom, fathom the inhumanity of it. That indeed, a settler colonial project meant to wipe out a people has no mercy. And we have to endure this for three generations. And where would I start to tell you of the daily humiliations that that we as Palestinians had to endure for 75 years of annexation of land, of driving us out of our homeland, of the daily arbitrary arrests, imprisonment, torture, home demolitions. Even the olive groves are being destroyed as we speak. Silent, silent genocide happening for decades. Decades of this. And in case you are among even the lucky ones. You could be even just driven out without being killed. And they've driven out millions. My dear brothers, my dear sisters, millions of us. Without ever, ever being able to come back home. Just as my parents, my dad now closing on nine and he's on his deathbed. I cannot even describe to you the pain that I have in my heart having to witness my father and mother having to die away from their homeland while begging, please bury me in my motherland. That is real. And we had to carry that. And indeed, if we're not listening to our voices, listen to the voices, the beautiful, courageous voices of even Israelis who've awakened to the truth, who see this suffering, the likes of Gabor Mate, the beautiful therapist, psychiatrist, a beautiful soul indeed, an author who treats so many from trauma. He himself, who is someone who survived the Holocaust as an infant, saying this, I can understand after the horrors of the Nazi genocide how we desperately want some protection for the Jews. I can understand all the warmth that Jews have for Israel. I used to be in the same camp, but none of this excuses what we're doing. There are no two sides, just as they want us to, have, to believe right now. The Israel-Hamas war. No, no, no. There are no two sides. In terms of power and control, he says, it's pretty straightforward. There was a land without a people. With a people, excuse me. There was a land with a people. The Palestinians, indigenous to the land. And there were other people who wanted it. And they took it. And they continue to take it over and over and over. And to continue to discriminate against, oppress, and dispose of those other people. And that's our story in a nutshell. Indeed, we carry all that pain, but also the pain of being dehumanized. You know this thing that I'm wearing right now, this scarf, Palestinian scarf? I proudly wore it this morning because I knew I can in your home, Abi. In your home, I feel safety. Do you know that I couldn't wear this for decades of my life? Because we're unsafe if we wear our cultural symbol. We become a threat. They've gone after not only our bodies and souls, but they've gone after our culture, the word Palestine itself, which they say it doesn't exist, which means we don't exist. Our cultural symbols, our foods, everything, they've gone after everything that we've become terrified of mentioning the word Palestine. This is what we're experiencing, and indeed, my own children who are born in this country have to experience it. When they're told in their school, you can't mention the word Palestine as your place of ancestry. This is happening right here in Montgomery County. We're witnessing to, a witness to all of this and much, much more. All if you hear the stories of those who are suffering and experience and understand their pain that they've carried not for a month or two, 
but for decades and decades. And all of this has been made possible by your tax dollars and my tax dollars. By the billions that we've been funneling into Israel. And the infinite, unconditional supply of weapons that right now is being used to commit genocide and kill children, right as we speak. So, so much indeed to carry and to witness, but indeed the eyes witness and the ears hear. And indeed the state of fast is, is one that summons us to awaken. So that we see how we respond and to understand how authentic we are to the profession of faith and what faith even means in this moment. What is our response to all of this suffering now that we've witnessed it? What is the spiritual and moral duty, the human duty, the duty of the heart of humanity? Indeed, Gabor Mate himself says, as a real, amazing, and beautiful soul that really inspires, just as you inspire me today. He says, whenever humanity witnesses violence, crimes against their siblings, what do they do? Humanity stands either in complicity while essentially demonizing the oppressed. But they're complicit in all kinds of ways. Or that they stand unconsciously, indifferent. They don't care. It's not of my business. I have my worries and concerns. Who cares about this? Indifferent or helplessly. They feel the pain. They see the suffering. But they cannot do anything. But or fourth stand up courageously and walk the walk of faith, of being human, of being compassionate. As Cornel West says, the beautiful soul, he said this, because we oftentimes talk of compassion and affection and love, but we don't know how to walk the walk. We're selective in our love, selective in our compassion. Whatever it's convenient and comfortable, we dispense it. But when it's not comfortable, And it's costly, Mm, we turn a blind eye away from that. Politicizing even compassion. So Cornel West says this. He says that indeed, justice is what love looks like in public. You want to really be loving when you see somebody oppressed. Your love for them means speaking justice for them. Being in solidarity with them publicly. Otherwise, it's not real love. It's fake. Just as love, or excuse me, intimacy is love, what what love looks like in private. Means that when I'm in privacy with you, mm, there's intimacy, openness to feel each other. That intimacy is that love in private, but indeed justice is what love looks like in public. And how pressing it is right now for all of us. After witnessing all that we've witnessed is to bear witness to that, but also to speak words of justice and to speak truthfully. I ask the question, what if Jesus Christ, what if Moses, what if Muhammad, what if Gandhi were with us today, witnessing all of this on this earth, what would they have done? Would they have just prayed in the comfort of their chambers and sanctuaries and mosques and synagogues and churches or their homes? Feeling comfortable about this? No. I would imagine after all that we've learned about them, and our very presence is inspired by these beautiful messengers of God and these people who have led with compassion and courage, especially when it's not convenient. They would have said, stood up and said, not in my name. Their hearts would have ached with pain. And they would have refused to turn their eyes away from it because some of us do that. It's too much to to handle. But the suffering is real. The cries are real. Their ears would have heard the cries. Their eyes would have shed tears. But they wouldn't have stayed there. They would have probably gone to Gaza by now. To wipe the tears and feed the children. To perhaps even put their bodies in front of them to take those bullets. And to take those bombs. They would have stood or would have known where to stand because it's a moment that is a test. Where do you stand? And tests and trials reveal for us who we are and where we need to stand. And we make choices. I know they would have st- stood with the, on the side of the oppressed. They wouldn't have stood on the side of the oppressor. And they would have spared no effort to save every single soul and every single child. 
They would have done so because they wanted to, they would have wanted to stand on the right side of history, on the right side of God, on the right side of their hearts and their humanity. They would have done so because all lives matter. And nothing is more precious than human life. They would have done so because a life there right now in Gaza and in Palestine is as equal as a life here. All a child of Gaza right now is as beloved as a child of Maryland. What if tens of thousands of them? Because saving a human life, as the Quran tells us, is like saving all of humanity. And killing one is like killing all of humanity. They would have done so because it is impossible for the eyes to witness all of this pain and witness the grieving mothers who are begging for help and the children who are crying and the bodies that are burned. It's impossible to witness all of this oppression that we're contributing to with our own money. 162 days later, it's impossible to do all of this and stand silently because it would compromise our own humanity and our own faith. They wouldn't have chosen that. They would have chosen to move to struggle for the liberation of, of, of Palestinians because ultimately when we speak of, of the past, it's nothing but for liberation. It's about liberation, my dear brothers and sisters. Like We're all in a quest for liberation. There's nothing more beautiful than living freely, living with dignity. And do Palestinians not deserve this? Several decades of this oppression that we're aiding and abetting. Indeed, in this moment, and as I wrap up, I, I tell you that I really mean it as a, as a human being, as a Muslim, as a Palestinian, and being with all of you, I am filled with hope. I am filled with hope and inspiration, yes, despite the anguish, despite the heartbrokenness, despite the tears that I have night and day. I'm inspired and full of hope because of the people of Gaza. Because if you really look at them, they taught all of us what faith is, what love looks like, what humanity looks like. They refuse to leave each other. They're willing to share the scraps of food with each other. They stay and, 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 and hold on to their land despite all the attempts at ethnically cleansing them. They continue to struggle for liberation year after year, month after month, day after day, day, and ultimately pay the ultimate price, their own bodies, their own souls. And they'll say, even if our entire families will be wiped right now, and they're being wiped, we're not going to give up on our quest for liberation. They're awakening all of us, and we're indeed awakened by others on this earth who are also making a stance despite being unpopular, South Africa, right now, who stood amongst the nations, because they're carrying the tradition of Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, Tutu, who said what? They said, the struggle of Palestinians is our struggle, and we cannot be free until they're free, every single one of them. They took a courageous stance, and indeed, South Africa right now is making that stance, and in inspiring all of us, and others have chosen the other side. States continue to aid and abet, including here in America, this genocide. Inspired by Aaron Bushnell, you heard of him, right? Aaron Bushnell, who's been witness. He served in the military. A young soul in his 20s witnessed the suffering in, in those few years of his life and said, I can't stand for this, and paid the ultimate price by setting himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy. That is what he's willing to sacrifice for justice and to speak truth. And to convey this message and transmit it to human beings to awaken them, to say, we cannot let this be. Dying in the process, indeed inspired by the courageous souls across this earth, including you. From all walks of life, all faiths, and no faith, it doesn't matter. People of hearts, people of souls. And indeed, this suffering has gone on for too long and it's shocking that it continues to happen. I was actually looking at my notes just yesterday, and every single time I go out and, and give a talk, I, I, make no, you know, I take note of the numbers. I said at the beginning, 5,000 Palestinians dead. Isn't it time? Then I see my note, 10,000. Then I saw 15, 20, 25, 30, 31. When does it end? Here we are. It, it really is shocking that we continue to allow this to happen, and we find comfort in just being in our lives sometimes. This is a dire moment indeed, and Palestinians right now are starving. 
Right now, they're being bombarded. Right now, children are crying. Right now, they're trapped with our own money, our billions of dollars and weapons. Indeed, it's a dire moment. It's a watershed moment in our history. This is our test. It is our challenge. We're, at, we're being called and summoned to walk the walk of Indeed, Jesus Christ and Moses and Muhammad and Gandhi and all the beautiful and courageous souls on this earth who have showed us what being human looks like, what being loving truly looks like, and what bearing witness to justice looks like in the moment when it matters. And that's a test for us, and it's a test for our own moral fabric. Indeed, we're being summoned to spare no effort to stop this genocide, and before more innocent lives are lost, to stand for justice, to... You know, for the sake of faith, for the sake of our own humanity, for, for the future generations who are going to ask us, for the sake of history, and for the sake of God who will one day ask us, when you have witnessed all of this, what have you done? I urge all of you to keep looking and to keep listening to the stories. I urge all of us to take a stance and save those innocent lives. And I urge all of you not to do so as a last step, but as a first step. Because the lowest thing we can do is ask for a ceasefire. And it's amazing that even saying ceasefire right now brings you attacks. Imagine ceasefire and the violence. Even that, to show you the type of culture we're in, the, the, the nature of the climate that we're in, and the climate of fear that terrifies you for even asking for ceasefire. Speaking of power and privilege, but indeed... We're asking for that not as a last step, but as a first step towards the liberation of Palestinians from the Israeli occupation and oppression that has been going on for the past 75 years. Indeed, our words and actions will be etched in time, etched in history. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to make that stance when it really matters. At the end, I ask God Almighty, O oh God, empower us to continue to hear the cries of children who are begging for help to feel the pain of the mothers and the fathers who are losing their families. I ask you, O oh God, to make our eyes and ears a witness to all the oppression and suffering that happens on this earth. We ask you, O oh God, to empower us to bring out of ourselves what is most beautiful, what is most compassionate, what is most loving, what is most human, and what is most just. Empower us to bring an end to all the suffering, and all the genocide, and, and all the systems of occupation and oppression that subjugate Palestinian people and all other oppressed people on this earth enable us to continue to walk the walk of faith and to bring out of ourselves what pleases you. Empower us to be the bearers of your divine love and justice, to lead with conv conviction and courage, and to never ever give up on our shared humanity. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Tarif, for your powerful reflection and call to action, inviting us to not just be in a prayerful space, but to actually live into our prayer with our feet and our actions. Sometimes just feels a bit awkward to be transitioning to announcements. <laughs> but here we are. Just a few quick ones. Join the Eighth Principle Embodiment Group for a sacred conversation about race at noon or thereabouts in room 35 today. Please bring your own lunch and stay for a deepening conversation. Also later this afternoon, join Cedar Laners and members of other faith communities from two to five at Harmony Hills Elementary in Silver Spring, Aspen Hill for the AIM Action in Montgomery Pre-K Action. 
We come together to support our community and take meaningful action for early childhood education in our county. And next Sunday, please join us for Celebration Sunday at 10.30 a.m. for our Building a New Way annual fund campaign. We're really thrilled to welcome former UUA president and transitional minister at All Souls, the Reverend Bill Sinkford, alongside our amazing Cedar Lane Choir delivering some soul-stirring music next week. Plus, we'll have engaging activities for children, for children, including therapy dogs and face painting. After the service, we will stick around for a delicious lunch in our brand new fellowship hall, which we keep promising you'll have a chance to be in next Sunday. Yes, let's give ourselves a big hand. Let's come together to express gratitude for our spiritual home and envision its bright future. So please, if you haven't registered, uh, don't forget to stop by the Celebration Sunday table to register for lunch and join the festivities, and we hope to see you all there. And again, if you are so moved to join this religious community, please see me after the service, and we would love to have you become a part of this faith. With that, Brother Kamyar, would you offer us a benediction and some words. I thank you all for being present. Your presence has brought a wave of love and unity and hope. Reminder that we are all here together. No matter what happens to who, we are neighbors. All of us are neighbors and family, and we help each other with all we can. Hafez says, Man haman dam ke vuzu saaktam az chashme ye eshq, chaar takbir zadam yek sare bar har chakas. That very moment, I washed my face from the spring of love, everything in the world started to move. An elephant is smaller than an ant in the eyes of the love. Oh, my drunk lovers, don't be disappointed from the gate of blessings. Blessings happen when the desire for it is when we all want to see happiness in each other. To continue and end the ceremony, I uh, play a song with Rumi words. He says, I was dead, now I'm alive. I was tears, now I am laughter. The universe of love invited me, and all I had to do was take a step. Hopefully together we can take this step further and further and further. There will always be darkness. There's always light. In this balance, let's dance together, giving each other space to breathe, to practice our own identity, to be united, to become water, to become air, to become sun. Now, you can sing along with me when I play this rhythm. You can say, Hu madadi, Hu madadi. Who madadi? It means God, universe, we are here to help. Its original meaning is, oh God, help. But I think at this time, with our awareness of how much we can do, instead of just sitting and reading, we put those words into action. So, oh universe, here we come. Who madadi? Who madadi? Ah. Who madadi? Who madadi? Oh, 
یا هم مددی مولا مددی نه هو مددی هو مددی هو مددی الله مددی یا حق مددی مولا مددی هو مددی هو مددی هو مددی الله مددی یا حق مددی مولا مددی هو مددی الله مددی یا حق مددی مولا مددی هی هو مددی الله مددی یا حق مددی مولا مددی هو مددی هو مددی هو مددی هو مددی الله مددی یا حق مددی مولا مددی Thank you.